Good morning, guys. Hi. Yeah, so today I would like to tell you a story about superheroes and superpowers, because we think that machine learning is a kind of superpower in computer science. And every superpower has some kind of origins. In case of machine learning, it's math. So we think it's really useful and helpful to understand the math under hood the machine learning when you deal with these methods. So my name is Lukasz Gebel, that's Piotr Czajka, Hello. and we are software engineers at TomTom. So we are coming from Łódź, from Poland, when we work in location and navigation services department, and we build services like maps, geofencing, matrix routing, and so on. Generally services that helps people to build location-oriented applications. But let's get back to the machine learning. So at first, we'd like to give you a big picture view of what is machine learning, and then go through supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And of course, at the end, we'd like to answer your questions. OK, so let's start with some simple definitions. <clears throat> The first one by Arthur Samuel, who was one of the founding fathers of AI. And according to him, machine learning is a field of study which gives our computers, our programs, the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So you probably won't do all of this if something happened, then do, and if else statements. You want to make your computer learn how to solve problems. And in the picture, you can see that Arthur Samuel is playing checkers with the computer that was able to learn how to play checkers by playing with the human players. The different definition less formal by one of our lecturers when we were studying, and he considered machine learning is every method that needs some kind of training. And he used this intuition that animals and people are usually considered to be intelligent. And we also train to solve problems. Yeah, we need to master them. And that's, that's, that's easy to say, make your computer learn. Because I, but I cannot do it. Yeah? I cannot give it a book and, hey, learn how to make money. It doesn't work that way. So let's look at the supervised learning. So personally, I like to compare supervised learning to being fought by a teacher. So where you at at school, your teacher probably gave you some examples. For, for example, like, like how to add numbers. And then for each example, you had the correct answer. And using these examples and correct answers, you were able to generalize and solve the problem. The same applies to supervised learning. So first of all, you need to choose your model. Usually it's a mathematical model, and it's like your student that will solve your task. Then you need to prepare a data set consisting of examples and correct answers for each example. Then you present your examples to your model, check how it responds, and then adjust model's parameters so it responds correctly. And one of the biggest family of algorithms in machine learning world are neural networks. And they have really vast number of applications. And the interesting fact is that they were inspired by biological brain mechanisms. So let's have a look at biological neuron. Um, it varies in a very simplistic view. Uh, electric signals from different neurons go through dendrites to our neuron cell. Then these signals are summed up. And if they are bigger than given threshold, our neuron cell produces its own signal, which goes through axon and that's how neurons are affecting each other. So this intuition was used to model artificial neurons. And here we've got inputs, which are real numbers, and they are like parts of our examples. We've got weights, which are also real numbers. And how does it work? So you have to take inputs, multiply by corresponding weight, and sum it all up, and put the sum into the activation function. And activation function produces a single real number, which is an output. Activation function may look like this. It's like classical activation function. It's called sigmoid. And this one simply maps our sum into the value from 0 to 1. Of course, there are a lot of different activation functions, like ReLU in deep learning world. But we will, in our examples, we will use this one. OK, the problem with neural networks are, is that, that at the first glance, that it may be really hard to understand it, because there are a lot of indices, numbers, formulas, and so on. And that's why we choose to explain machine learning with the use of very simple method, linear regression. So linear regression simply helps you to model relationships between variables. 
uh, and we will explain it with the real life problems. But we think that superheroes have really cool lives, so we will use problems from superheroes' lives. Okay, so let's ask ourselves a question. What defines a superhero? Do you have any ideas, guys? Long ears, maybe. Long ears, so you yeah. can be like a super spy or... Yeah, you hear really good. Okay, or like Elephant Dumbo, okay. I think that costume is quite important because, you know, usually we shouldn't judge the book by its cover, but let's, let's look at him. So the guy on the right, probably his superpower is being super creative, uh, but he's not very liable, yeah? He's not very tough. Accord and comparing to, to original Thor, who is majestic, strong, and so on, he looks pretty bad. So our problem is that we would like to invest some amount of money in our costume to be popular. So we did a serious scientific research, at, and we have found the most published superheroes ever. And for every superhero, we've got the number of comic book issues in which they appeared. And then, for them, we checked how much you have to pay for the costume on eBay. So that's how our data look like. Okay, and you always can learn something from your data. And we learned that you have to pay over $100 for Invisible Woman costumes. And there are two options. Yeah, either it's a brilliant scam. Yeah, or it's really a good costume, and now we should all buy it. But we'll leave the decision to yeah, you. Yeah, no, the choice is yours. Yeah, let's get back to math. Okay, our model in linear regression is simple line equation. So we've got two parameters, theta zero and theta one, x, which is a costume price, and the output of our function will be the number of comic book issues for a given costume price. Okay, and our data looks like this. These are the points, and our task is to find the line that fits our data in most optimal way. So it may be here, here, or somewhere there. Okay. So now, how to do it? So basically, we need an objective function. And objective function helps us to evaluate our model, so if it's good or bad. In our case, it will look like this. And, and uh, you have to calculate this, this uh, sum for using points from your data set. And what's the intuition behind this, this formula? So let's assume that for one point, our function gives us four but we were expecting two. So we've got four minus two, it's two, squared, it's four. It means that we need to add four to our sum. On the other hand, from, for different point, our function may give us one, and we may expect it one. So it's correct. Then we've got one minus one is zero, zero squared, it's still zero. So we do not need to add anything to our activation, uh, to our sum, to our objective function. And using this intuition, you see, so the, the less, the better. It means that we need to minimize the function to find the optimal data parameters. And how to do it? We'll use the gradient descent algorithm. And gradient descent algorithm is like a superhero of, of machine learning, in my opinion, because you will find him in very different flavors, in deep learning and very powerful methods, and, and it really works. So, here, we will iteratively update our theta parameters according to these complicated formulas. And it's, it's quite simple, though, because you need to subtract a alpha rate, alpha learning rate, which is a small real number, multiplied by these formulas, which are derivatives of our objective function. And you may think, dude, come on, derivatives, really. But the intuition behind derivative is that it gives you information how your function is changing. So let's look at the simple example. So let's assume that our objective function looks like this, and there is only one theta. And we are calculating the derivative at this point. At this point, our function is increasing. So it means that the derivative will be positive. So in our formula, we've got minus alpha times positive derivative. Minus times something positive gives us negative value. It means we need to subtract something from alpha, which means we are land to the left. And here, function is also increasing, so the derivative is still positive. So we are going to the left until we reach the minimum. 
On the other hand, if we calculate the derivative at this point, our function is decreasing. So the derivative is negative. So we've got negative alpha times negative derivative. Negative times negative gives us a positive value. It means we need to add something to our theta. Adding means going to the right. So we add something here and iteratively going down to the minimum. So it's like walking down the hill until you reach the minimum value. That's the idea behind gradient descent. OK, so now I will use it to solve our prob problem with costume. So I will use Octave. And Octave is like a cheap knockoff of MATLAB. Yeah, but it still works, so, you know. Yeah. Why, why pay? So here is the implementation of our uh, objective function. So we've got this f function minus expected value squared and so on. And the gradient descent algorithm, which is a very simple one. So for a given number of iterations, we're updating thetas. Here I've got theta, but it's a vectorized form. So under this variable, there are two thetas. And that's the formula for the derivative. OK, and the main code. So I load the data, extract examples, expected values, set theta alpha to this value, and I will run it for, let's say, 1,000 iterations. OK, let, let me run the example. And here are our optimal data, but let's plot result. So here it is. Yeah, so that's our, that's our solution. And now we can use it. So let's say that I would like to invest $1,000 in, in my costume. And according to this function, I should appear in over 8,000 comic book issues number, which is a quite good result. And solving this problem, we also learned something set about human nature, because it looks like the more you pay, the more popular you are. And that's probably why the Batman superpower is being rich. OK, let's get back to, to, Octa uh, to presentation. OK, and here we are. So let's assume that you'd like to separate Marvel superheroes from DC superheroes, so two different universes. Ideally, you could use straight line. But in real life, data is quite complex, mixed up, and so on. And usually, you need some nonlinear functions like this. And that's the part when neural networks comes to the rescue, because linear regression is linear. So let's, let's look at the simple neural network. So there are three layers, the input layer, the yellow one, with just pass the inputs to the hidden layer neurons, blue one, and this have uh, sigmoid, and sigmoid uh, and the hidden layer neuron in, uh, outputs are the inputs to the output, output layer, the red one, and the output layer produces the output of our neural network. And the green guys are biases, and you may think of them I, like they are giving our neural network some kind of flexibility while fitting the solution space. OK, so when you present your example, you need to get the parts of your example, put it as input to the first neuron, calculate the activation function for this neuron, then do it for the second neuron, the third one, and then activation functions from the, these neurons are inputs to the last neuron. You also calculate the activation function, and you have this output. And how to train neural network? So you will use the backpropagation step, backpropagation algorithm. And how does it work? So under the hood, it uses this idea about gradient descent. So it means you need to update every weight of every neuron. So let's say you've got an output for a given example. You can calculate error using the expected output. And then you need to combine this, this, this output, this error, and push it back through your network. And while you are pushing it back, you are using this gradient descent, of course, with a little bit different formulas, because now you will have the derivative of the activation function instead of, of, of our objective function from linear regression. But then you update literally every weight of every neuron iteratively. And that's how training works. So as you can see, there is no magic behind machine learning. So it's like simply randomized op optimization. 
So in general, it's like less or more complicated math. It's, there, there's no magic, sorry, sorry for that. But still, it's, it, these, are, these methods are really powerful. They'll, they can solve really complicated, complex problems. Okay, so I told you about it. So now I'd like to prove that neural network can solve a nonlinear problem. So we've got a costume, now we need a logo. Because you know, then we need to, sh to sell the t-shirts, yeah? Okay, and logos are usually nonlinear, so let's generate one with the use of neural network. I will come back to my octave. Oh, it's like bad cave. <laughs> okay, and the code from linear, uh, neural network. I will use the implementation of neural network from GitHub. You will find it in the link. And we will use uh, this data. Okay, so I will use the grid of points. 2D points, it looks like this. And every, every point has a label. So we've got X coordinate, Y coordinate, and the expected label, one or zero. And I want to make my neural network to learn how to distinct points that are po ones and zero. And then I will, I will draw, the, I will plot these points with different colors, and we will see what happens. Okay, so generate logo code looks like this. So I load the data, extract examples, expected labels. I will have 200 neurons in my hidden layer. I will train the network and run it for 1,000 iterations. And then I will take the same inputs for already trained network and make it generate the labels. Okay, so let me run it generate logo. And now all of this gradient descent stuff is happening. That's why it takes some time. But we should have the results. Oh, we, we got it. And now let's, let's plot it. So plot data, input, and predicted values. OK, and, and it turns out that our neural network learned how to distinct points that are inside the Batman equation from the points that are outside of it. So there are two problems with this logo. First of all, this logo is already taken, and Bruce Wayne is quite rich man. Well, and the second point is that it's not really something super to learn by heart, because all those examples were shown previously. So now we'll check uh, how it works for the, the stuff that it didn't see. Yeah. So now I will use the points that wasn't present during the training. It's like very thick grid of points. There will be around 25,000 of points. And now it, it looks like this. So you see there are no labels. I will use this network to, to generate labels. And the generate true superhero logo looks like this. So I will load this point, extract inputs, and generate labels for, for every, every point. OK. So generate true superhero logo. And here it is. Let's plot it. It's much more thick. Yeah. And that's what we get. So it may be like, I don't know, flying squirrel man yeah. or something like this. Yeah, elephant man with a short yeah. trunk. And, and, and you can see that it's not perfect, yeah? It's not perfect. There are some errors in the right corner. You cannot see the ears of the bat. But still, it was able to, to reflect this, this bat, bat logo. It's, it's quite similar to it. There is a resemblance. And that's how machine learning works. So you won't get the perfect answers, but you, are, you will get the good enough one. OK, so I think that I proved that neural network can solve quite complex nonlinear space. And now, that's the part when Piotr will tell you what happens when there is no teacher in the classroom. OK. Here you go. OK, so now for the unsupervised learning. And I will let it sink for a second now, because yes, they can learn by themselves. And although it might be surprising, we're still quite far away from Skynet. We're working on it. but. With this, well, it will be a bit harder because unsupervised learning, unlike supervised learning, is even 
for uh, is an emulation of even younger children, like in preschool. Because when you're a little children, you normally look at the world and try to find heads or tails, what seems to be the same with the other. Like, you know, we all thought that mushrooms are plants. And then after a lot of time, we learned that no, mushrooms are just mushrooms. And that's all. And well, that's the general idea behind, un behind unsupervised learning. We're trying to find similarities. And we're using real, really simple math. There are no derivatives. There's mostly multiplication, additions, and subtractions. So the, I think uh, this one illustrates uh, it the best. It, there was a scientific study about how language uh, interacts with the way we think. And this little picture, or a picture similar to that one, was shown to the children all around the world. Uh, and the general question was asked, what doesn't fit? And I bet that most of you, the same as I would say, we would say that grass doesn't fit, of course, because it's a plant, and cow and chicken, they're both animals. But to the surprise of some of the scientists, children from Asia said that, you know, chicken doesn't fit, because cow eats grass, and chicken doesn't eat grass, it doesn't eat cow, and it doesn't go the other way around, so it's not eaten by any of the, the other two. So there is some relation between them, but the relation might be a surprise for you if it is created by, well, a foreign mind, so to say. So you can be sometimes uh, surprised by your unsupervised learned neural network that, well, the similarities aren't so obvious at first glance. But on the other hand, if you know what the similarities are, maybe you should use mm, supervised learning than unsupervised one. So, as I said previously, uh, we use unsupervised learning uh, when we don't know what is the sorting key or keys because the data is either super complex and it's hard to distinguish that one true key or the data is quite uniform. And the first person who thought about that kind of learning was Professor Donald O'Hab. So, in fact, he was a professor in biology, but he was working at the same time as the first neural networks were created. Uh, so, of course, he was interested in that because, you know, the first electronic brain. Yeah, that, that makes people smile. And mm, he was really interested in supervised and unsupervised learning. And he thought, okay, so if natural brain cell works like this, that if a signal comes to it and it responds to that signal, the next time the same signal comes, it responds with a slightly bigger force, then maybe we could use the same intuition uh, to teach our neural networks. And so the simple Hebbian learning algorithm was born, and change of the given weight is proportional to the input to that weight times the output to that weight, and to, to the whole neuron, of course. And you know, this proportion is described by the learning coefficient. And as you can see, it, uh, it really grows quite fast, uh, if you think about it. So the professor also for, foresaw that, so he created a generalized Hebbian learning algorithm when he said, okay, so the change of weight should be a kind of function between input and output, but you should check which function works best for your neural network. So today, to show you where are the pitfalls of that kind of learning, we'll focus on the simple Hebbian learning algorithm. And to start, we have a neural mod neuron model, and it's not so different than what you saw previously. The only change is that little part here that is this module for Hebbian learning, and it works like that. So uh, in the beginning, we have an example with bias. It, the partial sums are calculated. Then the sum of, of the signals uh, are, is summed up. It goes through the activation functions, and we have an output. And then this output plus the inputs are taken into consideration to create updates of all the weights. So for the next example, our model can use its new weights. So for the demo part, so we have a superhero, we have a costume, we have a logo. So now at we should probably join some superhero team. So I've heard that after last year, there are some vacancies at the Avengers. So let's focus at those guys. And well, 
the four best Avengers, right? So Captain America, so he's the guy who's the natural born leader of the team. We have Iron Man, so he's, Tony Stark is a billionaire playboy, philanthropist, and of course he should repulse a race from his hands. And Hulk, who is strong, and that's basically all we can say about him. Uh, and of course Thor, son of Odin. So he's also a natural born leader. Uh, he, ha he can smite his enemies with lightning, but you know, those powers are reduced by Captain America and Iron Man. And we saw him fighting Hulk, and they were you know, quite an equal match. Uh, so basically Thor is a superhero team in one person. So, so we thought that maybe we can take even more superheroes, uh, divide them by similarity, and like in four buckets maybe, and then take one superhero from each group, and then you know, create a optimal superhero team. Yeah, like a super duper squad, yeah? Yeah, and well, to do that, we looked into Marvel database, where every superhero has its powers described using the six, att six attributes here up, and using those, we created unique vectors that describe every superhero. So there are some superheroes here, and let's try to see which of them are similar to one another using simple Hebian learning algorithm. Uh, okay. So, to the unsupervised learning, I'll go to the superheroes once again to show you them. And as you can see, I'm dividing every value in each vector by seven, because seven is the maximum value there is, and it's called normalization. We use it to ease the learning of our neuron, neural networks, because they work best for the values between minus one and one. So, it will help us a lot. And for the Hebian learning, so as you saw previously, we have the learning vector that it has bias appended to it. We're calculating the output uh, of the, in, well, the, the general output that is then summed up and put into sigmoid function uh, for our convenience. So then we can view which neuron responded for the given example. We're choosing the winner, so the one who responded with the biggest force. Uh, and then we're just updating all the weights of our neurons. Uh, for this test, we have chosen parameters like this. So we will show our superheroes 10 times because each epoch is the one time we show all the examples to our neural network. And we're using learning coefficient of such value, which is in fact very, very high for Hebian learning. Mm, and I will just run it for you so we can see. So it's pretty nice, we have two groups, but initially we wanted four, because every column here is one neuron, and one in that column means that that neuron is representing the group of that superhero. So I will run it several more times to show you that in reality, it will be really hard with those parameters to have uh, more than two, maybe, maybe we can get three, that would be lovely, but I bet if I run it several more times, we'll stick with two groups, Okay, so I can live with those two groups, really. Uh, so you can see that if I don't really put much attention into parameters, uh, it's hard to have comprehensive answers. And that's okay, because the simple, uh, simple Hebian learning algorithm is a bit unstable, uh, because those weights rise to infinity, and in the end, one or two neurons, they just have such great output for the slightest signal they, they encounter that in the end, even those neurons that fit better, they just, they, they just can't win with those guys. So, how do we fix it? Of course, we can do better, we can use better parameters, but, well, that's, that's not, not the best idea for a presentation, right? So, we'll go to the self-organizing networks. So, it's, it's still a kind of new network, but uses some fancy way of uh, finding similarities. So hopefully they won't be organizing into unions. And well, the main group of, of that kind of learning is learning with concurrency. So the general idea here is that we, we will be stripping our neurons of anything that is, well, unusable for us here. So we'll be just sticking with weights vector uh, and we'll be trying to have that weights vector be as similar as we can to the example it, this agent, this neuron represents. So the general idea is to make the neuron a kind of everyman, a medium value of its group. And we can do it in two ways. 
So there is a winner-takes-all strategy in which we choose the neuron that is most similar to the example, and we change its weights ever slightly. And with uh, the winner-takes-most algorithm, we're just uh, democratizing the, the learning, and of course, we're creating a ranking from the best to worst. But uh, now, we're not only teaching the best one, but also the first, second, and so runner-ups, so they also have a chance to learn a bit and explore the solution space. So it looks mostly like this, that if we have a neuron with its weights and an example, we calculate those partial distances, so then using them, we can use, for example, Euclidean distance to have one value, then, then we can compare to other neurons. And if this set neuron is the closest one to the example, we'll we're creating a learning step. So using this uh, partial distances, we can, uh, we, we, can, we multiply it by the learning coefficient, and then this value is subtracted from the weights of that neuron, and in the end for the next example, it uses those new values. Uh, and to give it a more visual uh, aspect, so if the neurons are in the middle and we're trying to distinguish our logos by the color, those, those neurons will move over the solution space until they reach a place where they can really stick, they don't move as much, and then we can say our neural network has been taught oh, or learned. So, coming back to the demo. Uh, we'll be using the same superheroes as previously, but with the new winner-takes-all and winner-takes-most algorithms. So now, uh, we're not adding any bias, and we're using the aforementioned Euclidean distance to check whether the example and neuron are similar to one another. We're, of course, creating the winner uh, vector, uh, not, but this time not only for our convenience, but also that using this winner vector, we will know which, um, sup which neuron responded the best to the example, and then we will teach only that one best neuron. Um, and I will show you winner takes most, well, m m one to one, so you see that the change is so slight, we're adding only this little part here, because in fact, we'll still be using the winner vector, but now it's not only ones and zeros. Now those values are between one and zero, and to create that neighborhood, that, that ranking, we're using the exponential function that takes into consideration the distance and number of epoch we're currently in. So uh, you learn less if you're further away, but you also learn less if you're further away and uh, it's another epoch of your learning, so you probably have found your niche, so we, we don't want to move you so much. And we teach all neurons this time. So, without further ado, I will just quickly show you that this time we'll be showing these superheroes only five times, and because it's really way better than Hebian learning, we'll be using even bigger par learning parameter here, because yeah, we want, we want to show you the downsides of this type of learning. So, I will just run the winner takes all algorithm, and you see, okay, we started similarly with two groups, but now we have four groups, and again, three groups, three groups, we can stay with three groups if we like, uh, because I would like to show you that for the winner takes most, we're starting with four. And it will be similar to that, we'll be getting four groups. So it, it, it seems so that this democratizing process, right, give, gives us better results. It's, it's not good to find that one best and just focus on that, per, that person, that agent. We should make it more, uh, more de democratic. So that proves that democracy really works. But of course, it's again the same problem that we had with uh, supervised learning. So these are the values that our neural network saw previously. So maybe now we should add our superhero uh, to the mix and see where our superhero would be located. Uh, and of course, you know the saying, so always be yourself, uh, unless you can be Batman, then just be Batman. And because we don't want to uh, f come up with some fancy numbers for our superheroes, uh, we, have, we have Batman ready to replace us. So we'll check in which group Batman is for all of our learning algorithms, and we'll check uh, 
if they found similar, uh, well, the, all the same sim similarities between superheroes. So, last one, winner takes most. And it appears that for heavy and learning is a third group, fourth group in winner takes all, and third group for the winner takes most. Okay, so let's scroll up and see what is in this mystical third group for heavy and learning. And we can see it's Wolverine, right? So it's this, this group, so it's Wolverine, Doctor Strange, and Captain America. Okay, we can live with those guys. I will just scroll back to the winner takes all. Uh, and this time it was the fourth group, I yeah, remember? Yeah, yeah, three, four, three. Okay, so there is Spider-Man, which wasn't previously the Black Panther, but there is also Wolverine and Captain America. And of course, well, we have Mr. Fantastic and those others guys, other guys, but you can see that both guys from Hebian Learning are also here in Winner Takes All. And let's come back to the Winner Takes Most, and the third group once again, it's Iron Man, Wolverine, no, not Wolverine, Black Panther, Doctor, and Doctor Strange, and Daredevil. So you see that it got mm, some of the superheroes that Winner Takes All also used, but it omitted completely the guys from Hebian Learning. Although you can see that it can find the, the, the similar key features from those superheroes because there are some hooks, some links between all those three algorithms. And of course, as I said, it, it works a bit better. It gives us more diverse groups. It wasn't hard to have three or four diverse groups in Winner Takes All and Winner Takes Most. Uh, it doesn't cluster so much at, as Hebian Learning, but it also has its downsides. Because if you don't work with your data and have all your examples in one place, and on the other hand, all your neurons will have values in the other, in the winner takes all, probably only one neuron will respond, because it will be the closest one to all those examples. So we really need to spread those values on the solution space. And for the winner takes most, it is, in, in reality, it is fixed. Uh, but it will take much longer because all those not so good learning vectors, uh, vectors will just need more time to, uh, to find their own niches. And to the finish. Yes, because this guy is incidentally from Finland. This is Professor Tuevo Kohonen, and he created something he called self organizing map. Uh, well, Although it sounds like something completely different and completely new for you, uh, it isn't. Because, in fact, it's the winner takes most algorithm with a little twist. It might look a bit intimidating if we look at how, how it is uh, written uh, here, but I will show you the picture. So, in reality, now the neighborhood is fixed. So, we're not creating this uh, ranking every time, but every neuron has fixed friends, fixed uh, neighbors, and when this one, this neuron is the best, it drags its neighbors with it. So in the end, the idea is that we want to drag our grid of neurons uh, onto the solution space and cover it tightly. Like you know, in the cold winter nights, you cover yourself with a blanket. So then, all, we have almost the certainty that every neuron has its own niche. And as for now, for those simple unsupervised learning networks, this gives us the best results. So if you have time, I really encourage you to check that one out because it's only a little twist winner takes most, but it gives you uh, a lot better performance, even if you have so preposterous parameters as we do. And, you know, to wrap it all up, so in fact, all the machine learning is the randomized optimization. And it sometimes really sticks in local optimums, but it's good because what you really need to take care of is the function that evaluates the output of your neural network. Because you have to put there everything you need. And in the end, this neural network will give you what you need. Math can give you the ideal answer, but we don't live in an ideal world. And in the end, those ideal stuff might not be even able to, to be created, or it can be hard to be created. So if you have something you really need that is on point, that's probably perfect. Yeah, because sometimes the good enough is the best you can afford, yeah? Uh, and although it is the end, uh, we also have a bibliography. If you would like to get our presentation with code and additional derivative counting, you can find it down here. 
It's the last position. There are also two great courses on Coursera. Uh, the first one is free, the second one uh, is paid, but they give you a very good insight into machine learning world. Uh, and, well, all those books and pages that are in between, just, if you like, please take a look, read, they are very good, and, well, we hope you will enjoy them at least as much as we enjoyed this presentation. <laughs> so now is the real end, so thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Feel free to talk to us after the presentation. We'll be around the venue all the day, so just feel free to have a chat. We'll be more than happy to do it with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, questions uh, in the on supervised learning how do you check or evaluate the how good if your solution uh, because you don't know when you fall in a optimum or local optimum yeah. if you don't have yeah. any information about your problem or your solution your possible solution how yeah. do you check so yeah, so, so basically you usually have to prepare your data set in this way that you have a training set and the test set and the validation set. And so you train your neural network or any different method on your training set. Then you check how it responds on the test set, so the data that wasn't present in, in your training set. Uh, and then you, you also checked on the validation set because you know that you can learn your network that it will fit to the test set because you, you checked on this, but the validation, validation data set gives you like more, more, uh, more uh, proper, proper, proper results, yeah. So that's, that's, that's how, you can, how you can do it, yeah. And if you, if you see that uh, you, you're stuck in the local minimum, it's not good. It's, you, can, you, you should probably uh, do some tweaking with your parameters, maybe the architecture of your network, and, and, and check how it, it works better. Okay, thank you. Mm, that is no more questions. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Thank you for the presentation, really nice. Uh, it's Antonio Botella, uh, working for Oracle. Uh, it was really nice to me and surprising to see MATLAB, <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. it's a more engineer language uh, with um, Matt's, uh, let's say, approach. And uh, I've seen so far machine learning AI uh, communities more relying on Python. How is the current uh, development status of libraries for MATLAB in order to make complicated, uh, complicated algorithms? Yeah, so... <clears throat> yeah, okay, so basically, mm, we, we didn't check a lot of libraries for MATLAB because what we really wanted to, to do here is show this, this basic math. Uh, as far as I remember, there is, uh, toolbox, a, yeah. Yeah, there is a toolbox for machine learning that uh, has uh, a lot of well, pre-made uh, neural networks that you can use. Uh, I think that recently there are also some deep networks uh, for more complex stuff, but that I'm not really sure. Uh, well, on one side, yeah, MATLAB is a great tool for that because as, as we've shown, it's mostly randomized optimization, so what can be better? But I think that the Python tools are the most up-to-date right now. Yeah, and, and MATLAB is MATLAB Octave or everything that, that you can use in, in this flavor. It's, it's also very good for fast prototyping, so you can use all of these math tools, get the prototype, and then move it to, to more fancy, fancy stuff, yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you very much for yeah. your talk. Thank you very much. Good See applause. you guys. Yeah, thank you.